Oh, well, Father, I thank you for your presence and your grace. I thank you for your truth and your word. That you'd speak to us out of from it today. We honour you in Jesus' name. You know, it, it is Father's Day. And uh, they say there's a big difference between a bad joke and a dad joke. It's the first letter. <laughs> and uh, But I, I do want to encourage you that if you've not had a great relationship with your dad, that we do have perfect Father in heaven. We've got a dad in heaven who we can honour and love and who just loves us so much. Uh, so I just want to share a few things that God has been speaking to me about and uh, I want to ask you, what do you see? In John chapter 3, verse 3, <clears throat> God's calling us. Jesus was meeting with a man called Nicodemus. We've got it all going on. It just keeps going. Is he whistling at me or what? <laughs> There's a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and he came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus said these amazing words, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He goes on further and repeats it again and says, You cannot enter the kingdom of God. He talks about being born again. But this thing that happens when we're born again, Jesus said you cannot see the kingdom unless you're born again. So seeing the kingdom is somehow related to that new birth. That as, we're, as we invite Christ into our life and something from God happens, something divine happens, we're birthed into his kingdom. We become new creatures. We're, we're new. We become alive to him. And there's something out of that impartation from God that allows us to see the kingdom. But I want to ask you, what do you see? When you think of the kingdom of God, what do you see? What, what comes to mind to you? That says to me in that verse that it's a spiritual thing. We've got to get it from God. It's a revelation of what the kingdom is about. We've got to, we've got to see the kingdom and, and see what God wants to do. It's so easy to look naturally because we're natural people. We can look naturally and say this is happening and that's happening, but we've got to see the kingdom. And we've got to, we've got to believe God for the kingdom to come. So I want to talk a little bit about this. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So he's made it a priority for us to seek the kingdom. When we're born again, we can see the kingdom, and we've got to seek the kingdom. So I want to talk about the kingdom of God. What is it to you? What do you see when you see the kingdom? I just want to break open a little bit about this. Neil has said <clears throat> that a word for him is a word for the church. And I really believe that. That the word that, that you know, we got recently, that Neil is an apostle to apostle, which says to me, if that's a word for us as a church, that we are an apostolic church. So to me, that's, that's got a lot of kingdom wrapped up in that term. So I want to break it open a little bit so we can see how it's, what it's supposed to mean for us as an apostolic church pursuing the kingdom of God. Are you with me? Okay, so, so what does it mean? What is, what is an apostle? Where does the word come from? It it's actually a, a, comes from the Romans. They stole it from the Romans. That uh, a Roman apostle, when the Romans came with their army and they conquered a territory, they would send in an apostle. The apostle had to go in and change the culture of that place so it became like Rome. You've heard that term, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. That was the apostle's job, to bring the culture of Rome to the conquered territory. So in the kingdom of God, when we have an apostle, their role is to bring the kingdom of God into our midst. Are you, are you hearing this? So as a church, our role is to bring the kingdom of God onto the earth. 
when we hear the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, this is how you pray. Our Father who is in heaven, you are holy, honored, you are honoured, you are holy. Let your will be done on earth <clears throat> like it is up there. That's an apostolic prayer, praying for the kingdom of God to come onto earth. Are you hearing this? So what does the kingdom mean to you? What do you see? Well, when I think about heaven, I think about the kingdom of God. God is up there and we're down here. And I think about what is it like? Have you ever wondered what is it like? What is it like in heaven? Anybody ever wondered that? What is it like? The most um, primary quality, I guess, the, the preeminent thing about heaven is the presence of God. That we come into the presence of God, that we come into his magnificent presence and God is there. And all things spring out of that presence out of his glory, of his majesty. It talks about him shining brighter than the sun. It doesn't need a sun up there because it's got the brightness of God, the, the magnificent presence of God. Have you noticed what Neil does every Sunday? Our apostle here. He stands up here and takes us into the presence of God. That's apostolic. To take us into his presence. To take us into the throne room where God can meet with us and minister to us and speak to us, where we come into his magnificent presence. That's what we're called to as a church. We're called to carry his presence, to be his ambassador, to be the ones who carry the presence of God wherever we go. Are you hearing me this morning? This making sense. I'm just trying to demystify the thing so it's not all this just this, you know, fancy terms. It's about walking with God and bringing the kingdom of God onto earth wherever we are. That's apostolic. Jesus said, you know, he, he cast out a devil out of somebody and got him healed. And he was accused by people saying, you're, you're, you know, how are you doing this thing? And he answered this and he says, if I, by the finger of God, cast out the devil, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God is where God is king. It's where God rules. It's where the power of God is displayed. And the power of God comes where the king, God is king. Can you imagine what it's like in heaven where there are no devils? That's the role of an apostolic church, to get rid of all the devils. To bring the power of God and to bring a cleansing of that rubbish. Are you hearing this? What do you see? See, we will go to what we see, to what we look at. So what do you see when you, when you see the kingdom? Unless you're born again, you can't see it. It's a revelation. It's a truth. It's our, it's our future. It's what we must pursue to seek first his kingdom, to lay aside all these other things, to see the kingdom of God come and the devils get out. Are you hearing this? where the power of God sweeps into a place and he has his way. And there are miracles. People are healed, delivered, saved, the, the, and the might of God is manifest. That's what we call to, friends. That's what I'm believing for. I'm believing for this glorious future, this great move of God, this apostolic move that is coming where the kingdom of God is manifest in our midst. That's what I'm believing for. That's what God has prophesied and spoken to us several times now. You have a go back and read those words and see what they said. That's what God is saying. It's an apostolic move where the presence of God comes, where the kingdom of heaven comes on earth like it is up there. I'm hungry for that. I don't know about you, but I'm believing for that. This, there's, there's life in this. There's energy. There's the presence of God. See, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. There are five ascension gift ministries we can read about in Ephesians chapter 4. We've got apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. So God wants to work. He wants to. And we're called to be an apostolic church. You know, I, I remember a story. I was, I was pastoring in a little country town, New South Wales, and um, I was just believing God for revival. And I, was, I lived 20 minutes out of town, and I was driving into town down this dirt road, and I was praying for revival. God, give me revival. 
God, I want revival. I'm hungry for revival. Give me the spirit of revival. Does anybody want revival? I'm hungry for revival. What? Why don't we just stand and pray for it right now? We just stand and agree with me for a spirit of revival to come. We need it. We need God. We need God. Father, we ask you for a spirit of revival. We ask you for it in our midst, for our nation, for our community, for our church, for the spirit of revival, God. We ask you. Come on, lift your voice. Lift your voice. Father, we ask you for it. We ask you for it. We ask you for a spirit of revival, God, that you'd move in our midst, that you'd move so powerfully for this great power and presence of God in our midst to touch lives, to save people, to deliver them, to move, God. Give it to us. Give it to us. Give it to us. We ask you. We thank you. We honour you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for praying with me. Please excuse me if I snuffle a little bit. There must be some pollen or something around here. But uh, uh, when I was praying that in my car, you know how, I mean, God is everywhere, but somehow or other he can show up more powerfully at times. I was praying for the spirit of revival and God came into my car. He came in there and, and sat beside me, this, this tangible presence of God. Isaiah talks about the seven spirits of God, which are really just different aspects of who God is. The spirit of might, the spirit of counsel and wisdom, and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. I was praying for revival and God came in and sat in my car and he gave me the fear of the Lord. And, and I, I remember once in year seven, I think it was in year seven at school, I cheated on a maths test. I brought in and brought in this, you know, I put this little calculation I was supposed to remember, a kid in a little piece of paper. The teacher caught me. I don't think I've ever cheated on a test since. But I want to tell you this when you stand before Almighty God and He looks at you, you cannot cheat that. You, you cannot get away when God assesses you. When the fear of the Lord came into my vehicle, I found myself, I, I was honestly terrified. Absolutely scared, spitless. With, with God in the car with me. And I began to repent. I repented of everything I could think of. I repented of everything I could remember. I repented of everything that I think I might have done. I repented of everything I think I might do. I repented of everything that came through my head. And just the, the deep, deep, deep conviction that God brought with the fear of the Lord. And I, I can tell you that when the Spirit of God comes like that, that He brings deep conviction. The Spirit of God has come to convict us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And He brings deep, deep conviction. And when you stand there, there's, there's no question about what's right or wrong before God. There's no argument. There is no trying to convince it you differently, that this is right or that's wrong. And, uh, you know, I look at our nation at the moment, I look at Australia, and I'm believing for that spirit to come into our land somehow, because it's like that verse in Romans that says, when you put away a knowledge of God, when you put it aside, then you are given over to a reprobate mind. And it's like there are aspects in our nation that is given over to reprobate thinking. And our nation needs a consciousness of God again. A consciousness of the presence of God again. A consciousness that God is real and powerful and holy. We need that consciousness of God. And you know what God is going to do that with? He's going to do it through an apostolic people who bring the presence of God. I believe that's part of our mission and our call and our purpose to bring the presence of God and a conscious awareness of God back into our nation. Are you hearing me? I, I honestly believe that that's part of it. 
when the fear of the Lord comes in, there's no arguing with that. When God touches somebody's life, when you have an encounter with the living God, there's no argument, there's no you know, trying to squeeze, trying to argue this or that, you know, love is love or whatever. It, it just doesn't wash before God. There's no cheating on that assessment. You hear me? When God comes in in power, when God comes, he does away with that thing. I was reading a book by, by um, Ernest Gordon, I believe it was, called Miracle on the River Kwai. Anybody read that? A few of you? You might have heard of the movie Bridge on the River Kwai. Nothing like it. <laughs> you might have heard of the movie The Railway Man. It's, it's about the same area in Kanchenbury, Thailand, during the Second World War, where the Japanese had prisoners of war building a railway. And this fellow called Ernest Gordon tells his story, being a prisoner of war, building this railway. And the, the Japanese were fairly brutal, with no respect for life. And as prisoners of war, they had to you know, do it pretty tough building this railway. And he tells this astonishing story about a move of God in this POW camp. He says, one day they were all lined up and the Japanese guards had counted the shovels and one shovel was missing. And so they started screaming at these soldiers, where is the missing shovel? Who took the missing shovel? And they were all going to be beaten mercilessly because of a missing shovel. One soldier decided to take the blame for this missing shovel. And he stepped forward and said, I took the shovel. Japanese soldiers beat him to death. A while later they recounted and found that there were no shovels missing. But they spent, said, the story goes, that that man's selfless courage shifted the whole spirit of that camp. Prior to then, they'd be bickering and fighting over food scraps and you know, arguing against one another. But after that, after somebody courageously stood up and laid down his life for everyone else, the shift in the spirit of that place. And they began to honour God and began to respect one another, and began to feed each other and began to care for one another and, and began to, you know, the, the less sick would care for the more sick and they, they would selflessly give it to each other and a shift came in the spirit over that place and they began to study <coughs> and, and pursue God and the presence of God, he said, was tangible in that place. You see, what is it going to take for Australia <laughs> to shift the spirit over our nation? What is it going to take for us to, 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 to step up? I believe that we're going to have to, you know, sometimes it's going to take some selfless courage. It's going to take something for us to step up into this purpose that God has got for us, to be an apostolic church, to, to see a change in the spirit over our nation and see the kingdom of God for our nation. What do you see for Australia? What do you see for the Sunshine Coast? What do you see just here for our church? What is it that you see? Do you see the kingdom of God? You see, unless we see it, we won't pursue it. We've got to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. I heard this uh, study done in America about cities that had the most church attendance also had the most social problems. Somehow or other, there was this incredible disconnect between what the church was supposed to do and what was happening. And, and you know, I, I personally believe that, that, you know, somehow or other, the church has got to become mature. We've got to have a mature perspective. Are you hearing me? That shouldn't be like that. That as the church matures and steps up into all we're supposed to be, into the fullness of the knowledge of the Son of God, there should be an incredible transformation occur in our nation. Are you hearing this? 
That's what, that's what we should be pursuing. That's what I'm hungry for. I want to see a transformation, not just in the spirit over our nation, but in how our nation flourishes and functions. I'm seeking God for it. Hungry for it. Want to see God move, not just to make the churches bigger, but to influence our whole nation and make our nation a disciple nation. The Great Commission is to go forth and make disciples of nations, not just individuals. Are you hearing this? What do you see when you see the kingdom? I, I, I'm, I want to look bigger than just me. I want, to see, I want to see the big picture. I want to see, God, what are you doing in our nation? Because if it's just me, it's great, but I think, I think there's more. Hello? So, you know, I propose to you that one of, the, one of the challenges that we have in this is that we've got to go on to maturity. Hebrews 6.1 says, let us go on to maturity, not laying again the foundations of the doctrine of Christ, of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. One of the challenges that we have when we go into that place of repentance, we get deeply convicted about sin. But unless we go on to maturity, we stay revolved around this consciousness of sin. So that happened to me quite a long time ago, but I hope that I've matured in my understanding and walked with God since then, that I don't need a continual whack up the side of the head with the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, not the end. So, so what happens to us when we get deeply convicted of sin is we get this abhorrent revulsion to it. We get cleansed from it. And then when we look around and we see others or our government or you know, sin of some sort, our government's making some sort of sin laws or, or something or other, our response can be immature and we can say this. I've heard this said by people who are supposed to be mature Christians and they say, God is going to judge our nation because of that. Anybody heard that? You know what I'm saying? And that theology that God is going to judge the nation, I mean, haven't we read in John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But John 3, 17 says... But God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But when we say God is going to judge, what we're doing is, is Jesus on the cross took all of our judgment. And it's like we come along and say, Jesus, I'm taking you off the cross and I'm going to take the judgment and put it back on the world. We're supposed to speak redemption over the world, not judgment. Don't we understand that as Christians we have authority in the realm of the Spirit? And we can bring judgment rather than the, the power of the gospel to save. Are you hearing where I'm coming from? See, Romans says this. It says, the whole of creation groans waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. It's waiting for us to step into that fullness because who knows that, that creation is waiting for its own born-again experience. That's what it says in Romans. It, it, it's, there's a, there's a, something that we're supposed to bring. We're supposed to bring redemption to this world, not judgment. Hello? So when the fear of God comes and the conviction of God comes, it's so that we can enter in to the salvation that God has, not so that we can be focused around the sin. We've got to go on to maturity and to see redemption for our nation, not for judgment. Because certainly there's plenty of sin. You don't have to look far. There's plenty of mess-ups going on. Like Neil said, we don't need people to tell us it's messed up. I don't need people to tell me. God has shown me quite clearly. He's also shown me the pathway to, to salvation and to, into his loving arms of redemption that he has cleansed me and I'm born again. I'm born again of incorruptible seed of the word of God that lives and abides forever. I'm created in his image. I'm created in true righteousness and holiness. If I believe that I'm a sinner saved by faith, then by faith I will sin. 
I'm not a sinner. I've been born again. I'm a new creature. Hello? So are you if you've been born again. If you haven't been born again, there's a great journey for you. The redemption is we're supposed to bring to our nation and to the Sunshine Coast. What do you see when you think of the kingdom of God? What do you see? I see a nation that's so transformed and changed. I see when the presence of God comes. Excuse me. And this. I see I'm not going to have any more trouble with hay fever. I, I, I see us entering into this glorious future. I see the church rising up in the magnificence of the knowledge of Christ. I see the King of Glory coming in. I see this conscious awareness of God right across the Sunshine Coast, right across our nation, influencing our nation. I see this great awakening coming, this apostolic move. I see people being transformed and redeemed. I see Australia being known as a nation of honour because it's of respect towards God, not as a nation of sledging and backbiting and mockery, which we've got a history of. I see a different nation, friends. I'm believing for the kingdom of God in our midst. I see it, friends. I see a place that's known for its reconciliation and its desire to connect and to forgive, not judge. I see a nation that's known for its, for its wholeness in its people because they stand in the wholeness of the living God. I see a nation that's known for the presence of God in our midst and the power of God in our midst that when people come onto our shores, they come and the devils leave. I see, a, I see the glory of God coming to Australia in might and in power and life. And I see people coming hungry for God from all around the world to our nation because they're hungry for what God is doing in our midst. That's what I see, friends. What do you see? I, I, I'm just trying to encourage you into a bigger vision to pray for it and to believe for it. Because I think it's gonna, it, it might take a little while, but that's our future. That's where we're going to head. We're called to be an apostolic nation, not just one that's sitting back and just, you know, playing church and, and you know, all the social problems are just increasing. I see such a change and such a shift. We're called to have a long-term view. It might take a while, but God is a God of generations. I want a nation where my grandchildren can grow up free from the fear of persecution because they honour God. I want to see a nation where, where you know, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac and, and Jacob. He's not just one generation, he's generations. Here's a thought for you. Let me finish with this. Jesus is coming back as the groom and the church is his bride. But there's a very difference in perspective between groom and bride. The bride prepares for the wedding. And there's a sense where we are need to be prepared for that wedding. Jesus is coming back for a perfect bride without spot or wrinkle. A spot is a blemish and a wrinkle is a gathering in the wrong place. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> he, Jesus is coming back for a magnificent, overcoming, victorious bride. Not a church hiding in the, in the corner, waiting for a rescue. He's coming back for something that's victorious and overcoming. We've got to step up into that. A bride prepares for the wedding day, but a groom prepares for the marriage. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you but he's asked us to prepare a place for him. That's our future. He's asked us to prepare this nation for him, to prepare it, a place where he can come and say, until the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God. It says it again and again and again. That's our future as a nation. I get this sense that, that some of us have burned hot for God, but I, I got this image in my mind of like this hot belly stove that's burned hot, but there's a flue that goes up and inside that flue is, is full of soot and 
ash, and it's like the flu's a little bit choked up. And I just sense that there are like people here, and your, your desire is to, to burn hot. But somehow or other, the things that have gone through and the stuff that you've been through have, have just choked you up a little bit. And God wants to set you free. God wants to release you afresh so you can burn hot afresh with fresh air flowing, fresh life and freshness. So if you identify with that, nearly if you'd come and, and pray for people and, and believe God with them, uh, you know, we want to we wanna help you. As Neil said this morning, God is trying to unravel us from wrong thinking. He's trying to set us free. He's trying to get us into a glorious future and a glorious hope. I believe that's what he wants us to do. But unless we see it, we can't go there. And things get in our vision of, of stuff that's going on. And he wants to clean the windscreen of our mind so we can see the kingdom, so we can see the future. And faith can rise in us. We can believe it and hunger for it and enter into it. So if that's you, would you come? We'll love to believe God with you and, and pray for you and see the presence and power of God come and help us enter into that future. Thank you. Thank you.